Well, imagine never having to worry about hurricanes and energy impact. Uh, imagine never having to gas up your car again or recharge your cell phone. An endless supply of energy that does not harm the environment and won't cost you a dime. In fact, it comes from thin air. My next guest says the technology exists. Here to explain how it works is Sean McCarthy. He's CEO of a company called Storm. It's a, a technology uh, firm based in Ireland. Good to have you, sir. Good evening. Uh, this almost sounds too good to be true. Now, I know you're a genius, but if you can explain it in layman's terms for me. What, what we've done is, um, about three years ago, we developed a way of constructing magnetic fields so that when you travel around the field, you suffer a net gain of energy. Um, this energy, we have proven over the years, doesn't come from any other source. What that means in terms of a product is, is quite literally that, you know, if we deploy this as, as a replacement for your car engine, you'll never have to put gas into your car. We, we replace a battery in your cell phone. You'll never have to recharge your phone. But where is the energy coming from, Sean? Literally, um, there has never been an identifiable source for the energy. Um, what this technology um, is doing is, is directly contradicting one of the basic laws of physics, the, the principle of the conservation of energy. So what we did last week is to issue a challenge to the world of science to ask them to come and to test it and to let the public know that this tele technology exists. So, and they, they were impressed with what they saw. Uh, there's something about the magnetic... Uh uh, images or, or, or presence that, that, that makes this work, my immediate reaction to that was, is there any hazard, danger, um, cancer-causing type of vulnerability here, anything like that? No, I, I mean, anything that has um, electrical energy in it uh, generates a magnetic field. The, the kind of magnetic fields we're looking at here are very low level. Um, and the technology itself is, is shielded, so there is no discernible magnetic field outside of the technology itself. Our key focus at the moment is to um, start a process of very in-depth um, validation from the scientific world, which will start um, later this year, and we expect the results of that to be released um, towards the end of next year. You realize if you're onto something, Sean, you've driven the automobile business out of business and a host of others that I, depend I, on battery and fuel juice. I, I, th I don't see it. I think this is an opportunity. I mean, I think that um, one of the key issues that we face um, is are, are polluting energy sources. Um, this isn't going to put the automotive industry out of business, and quite the opposite. We see this as a huge opportunity um, for you know, cleaner automobiles, um, for less toxic um, batteries. All right. Um, your private concern right now, you're deliberately not doing this to raise money, just to increase professional recognition by which you can later on get funding, right? Yeah, what, what we've said is, is because claims like this have obviously been made in the past, um, right. we've distinguished ourselves from, from other claimants by first of all saying, during this process we're not going to attempt to commercialize. This, is, this needs to be an honest review from the world of science. Um, we will neither raise money um, nor license the technology until the world of science has fully acknowledged that the, that the results, um, okay. have published the results of their technology and shown this to work. Our, our key focus at this point is, is simply to allow the public to see that this technology is available. We'll look then at commercialization after that. All right, Sean McCarthy, thank you. Thank you. Now to another good idea and imagine a machine that could power your house for free. Well, that's exactly what two Australian inventors claim they've developed. Using magnets and a battery, their new generator has been described as revolutionary and foreign investors are lining up for a piece of the action. Chris Allen reports. So, John, this is the machine? Yes, this is it. Chris, what's it capable of? Well, it'll, it'll power a house. This will, the machine will provide, provide sufficient electricity to run a house and have power to burn. It sounds too good to be true, but inventor John Christie is convinced his machine will change the world. So John, basically you're saying this machine can produce five times as much power as it consumes. Yes, it, it does. This one, exactly as we see it, it does. And in fact, it can produce more than that. Once kick-started from a battery, John and his partner Lou Britz say this prototype will run for years without stopping generating 24 kilowatts of power a day. You don't get more revolutionary, I think. I mean, we're talking about something that has the capacity to change the way that the world produces its electric power. It has the capacity to change the way that motor cars are, uh, are propelled. It can, it can replace the combustion engine, in fact. John, these are big claims. Are you sure you can live up to them? 
We don't really need to live up to them, Chris. What, what the, the technology speaks for itself. I mean, a householder could buy one of these machines and install it in his garage and power his house forever without buying another kilowatt from a retailer. I mean, that's how serious it is. Steve Brassington is an independent electrical engineer. He's seen the machine and backs up everything John says. It's revolutionary. That's the only way to describe it. I think the, um, the technology, it's not bending physics, it's just using principles um, that I guess are, are commonly in use in power generation today in a different way. These guys have thought outside of the square. Basically it's magnetic attraction and magnetic repulsion that provide the movement or the moment of the, of the motor. Can you understand why some scientists are sceptical about it? There is no physicist or, or engineer who has looked at our, our um, motor or has looked at our figures who says it doesn't work. Lou is an electrician and John a businessman in Cairns in far north Queensland. The two unlikely inventors have been tinkering with their machine for six years. They've applied for an international patent and have been swamped by people wanting a piece of the action. The, uh, here's the coil, so we mentioned the coils don't get hot. Mm -hmm. Local we'll businessman Alex Roma is one of the many offering money to help develop the generator. If it proves up to, uh, to be uh, what they say it is, it certainly would be something I'd uh, invest in. John has also spoken to millionaire inventor George Lewin, the man who came up with the Triton workbench and who's now setting up a fund to stop Australian inventions going overseas. There's an opportunity here, I think, to share an invention with the world um, that is beyond anything that we've ever contemplated before. Since the 8th century, scientists have been trying to develop a machine with the power to change the world, able to produce a limitless supply of energy. Leonardo da Vinci declared it an impossibility. Others, including Johann Bessler in the 18th century, claimed success. They were dismissed as charlatans. But is the search at an end? Has the holy grail of science been discovered in this Dublin business park? The businessmen behind the claim say this test rig proves their theory. As it turns, it's making more energy than it's using. What we found is that when you construct certain magnetic fields using permanent magnets, the kind of magnets you have in your fridge, um, that certain constructions of, of, of these magnets cause certain fields. When you travel around the field, stopping and starting at the same position, you, you, you gain energy. The trained engineer who set up Stiorn says the results were found by accident three years ago. Eight people and organizations have tested the theory, but they won't say who. The company's claims have drawn a surprising response from physicists. We get daily, you know, emails, you know, telling us that, that um, you know, that, that we're, somebody's going to come around and beat us up. We have had um, certain people involved in the project phoned up by a physicist who told this person to watch their back. Um, you know, we've had bloggers turn up to the office. I've had one blogger turn up to my home. Um, it is amazing the depth of, of, of feeling. And it, it, this is fundamentalism from, from a scientific point of view. This is... Literally, the reaction to our claim here is a religious reaction. It's the only way that I, that I, that I can put it in, in, in a way that people will understand. Undaunted, they put this advert in The Economist, inviting scientists to join a jury of 12 to test their findings. A counter on their website suggests nearly 5,000 have replied. Stiorn will fund the research as long as the scientists agree to publish their results. We, we would like them to be as widespread as possible, ideally geographically, but it's very important that they are the best people in the field. There's no value in us doing this and then ending up with a jury that, can be, that we can be told, well, actually, they're not the most qualified people. So we have to get the most qualified people we can get. Otherwise, it won't hold water. But why are so many so sceptical? Because it challenges the very foundations of physics. There are two fundamental laws that... Uh, that we consider in th thermodynamics, the laws of thermodynamics. And the first law says that you cannot create or destroy energy. And uh, you can only convert it from one form to another. And the second law of thermodynamics says if you put energy into a system, you can't get all of that energy out. But there's, a, there's always a possibility that we will find something extraordinary. But I have to say I'm a bit sceptical that we are going to find something that will break all the, the observed laws. 
The testing could take years, but it's still a high-risk strategy. Storm staff know they face global ridicule if the verdict is damning. The prize for success is a priceless patent, which would end their dependence on oil and potentially extinguish poverty, famine and drought. Now the jury must deliberate. Robert Nisbet, Sky News, Dublin. Lonnie Johnson is what you would call a prolific inventor. The engineer holds more than 100 patents, inspired to create ever since he was a child. I was always curious about how things worked. I would take my siblings' toys apart. To Sometimes I put them back together. Sometimes I put use parts to make something else totally different. When he was a teenager, Johnson won an engineering contest with a robot he built while growing up in the segregated South. We were the only black school represented. But Linux was such an impressive piece of work that we were able to walk away with first place. Years later, as an engineer for NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, Johnson helped design the Galileo mission to Jupiter and the Mars Observer projects. But Johnson's biggest claim to fame was engineering this toy, the Super Soaker Squirt Gun. More than a billion dollars in sales later, Johnson had the resources to work on his real life's mission finding ways to power the world without polluting it. That was my strategy because I was having a lot of trouble getting investors or people to support the research that I wanted to do in the hard science area. The engineer started two companies, located them in what was once a blighted Atlanta neighborhood, and hired fellow scientists to work on his mission. We've done some things at the research level that a lot of people have predicted were impossible and could not work. Johnson and his team spent seven years developing this lithium air battery. A battery, he says, provides ten times more energy than the most powerful batteries now on the market. Whereas the auto industry now is trying to get to 100 miles on a single charge, you'd actually be able to charge your car and drive uh, up to 1,000 miles on one charge nonstop. So that would eliminate the reservation that a lot of people have about electric cars. Johnson has tested the battery's ability in the lab time and again. But in order to get the battery to work in an electric car, it needs to be larger, and scaling it up takes big money. We could actually put it in a car and drive a car, I'd say 12 to 18 months if we had adequate funding. But Johnson says companies with far more resources are starting to catch up. Now we've got large entities like the National Laboratories and the IBM and others who have very deep pockets are starting to focus on this technology. So we've got to run faster to stay ahead. The other potentially world-changing invention he's developed is this engine. The JTEC converts heat to electricity. Popular Mechanics magazine awarded the JTEC its breakthrough prize in 2008. And the National Science Foundation has said the JTEC has, quote, a good chance of being the best thing on Earth. It took us a while to convince people that even the engine was real and it could work. Johnson says the engine which pushes hydrogen through a membrane, could power entire cities once it's scaled up. If we had a way of converting heat from the sun to electricity as, as, as cost effectively as we can burn coal or, or gas or, or natural gas to produce electricity, then you know, we would be using the sun a lot more. This would really, literally change the world if we were successful. Johnson has received some funding from the Department of Energy and support from the Department of Defense but not enough to get the project commercialized. That, he says, will take several million dollars. Everything depends on resources. I could have an engine working in, in, inside of a year at this point. So far, Johnson has mostly gone it alone. It has been a major personal investment. The 61-year-old hopes will pay off in his lifetime. If it doesn't, it won't be for a lack of trying. <laughs> Turn the machine on. Jimmy Klein fires up his hot new invention. His machine emits a flame that feels only slightly warm to the touch. But watch what happens when he touches anything else. Instantaneously, I can burn a hole right down through the center of that brick. The flame instantly turns hotter than the surface of the sun. Heat so intense it takes only seconds to literally burn a hole through charcoal. Three seconds turns a brass ball to glowing liquid metal. Tungsten lights up like a sparkler. Steel, lead, and other metal slices on contact. Yet the tip of the welder stays cool to the touch. No other gas will, will do this. 
Jenny Klein uses an alternative fuel source once thought impossible. He says people still have trouble believing him when he reveals his liquid fuel. Water. Take water and electricity and we break it down through our uh, very unique electrolysis process. Klein has just patented his process of converting H2O to HHO, producing a gas that combines the atomic power of hydrogen with the chemical stability of water. It turns right back to water. You can see the water running off of this. Klein originally designed his water burning engine for cutting metal. He thought his invention would replace volatile acetylene in welding factories. Then one day, as he drove to his laboratory in Clearwater, he thought of another way to burn his HHO gas. On a 100-mile trip, uh, we use about four ounces of water. Klein says his prototype 1994 Ford Escort can travel exclusively on water, though he currently has it rigged to run as a water and gasoline hybrid. Simply uh, speaking, we can change the world by reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. These are equivalent to our... Uh... Pete Dominici is helping Klein take his hydrogen technology patents from a two-room office in Clearwater to consumer markets around the world. You know what? Microsoft came out of nowhere, came out of the garage. Why not hydrogen technologies? The duo is already in negotiations with one U.S. automaker and the U.S. government. Their plans have grown from basic welding with water to powering the entire world from the safest and cleanest fuel on earth. Craig Patrick, Fox News. Members of Congress recently invited Denny Klein to Washington to demonstrate his technology. Now his company is currently developing a Hummer for the U.S. military that can run on both water and gasoline. So far, his water-powered engines have passed all performance safety inspections, so all systems appear to be go right now and gives new meaning to the term running water. You just have to hope that water prices don't go up like the gas. <laughs> yeah. In the top, our news here at 6 o'clock, an age-old dream becoming a reality. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. Water has always been considered a precious commodity, but Stan Meyer's invention may make it even more valuable. He has developed what's called a water fuel cell. It has taken the place of his old gas tank. The water fuel cell breaks down water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is used to run his doom buggy. I don't care if you use rainwater, well water, city water, ocean water. If you don't have any fresh water, go ahead and use snow. If you don't have any snow available to you, they use salt water because there's no adverse effect to the fuel cell. Meyer started working on this project four years ago. He's not a scientist. He isn't even a chemist. In fact, he never graduated from college. Myers was determined, he says, to design something to protect this country from oil embargoes. And we have calculated that if we take the dune buggy from Los Angeles to New York, we would roughly use 22 gallons of water. The Pentagon flew a lieutenant colonel in last week to look at Meyer's invention. There's talk of possibly using it in the Star Wars defense program and to run army tanks. Myers is currently perfecting a water fuel cell for cars. It will cost about $1,500. He says it won't need any maintenance and you won't have to replace it. It'll be at least two years before the fuel system goes into mass production. The day it happens will be one the fuel industry hates, but it'll put a smile on the face of those who've had to say at one time or another, fill her up. I'm Ralph Robinson. As you can see, many patents have already been received and many more are forthcoming. To date, over 42 patents have been applied for. Right now we have the entrenched energy monopolies and cartels. You know, we have OPEC and we have the seven sister oil companies that control all the oil and energy. But what people have to understand is that the people who run the energy business in this world, which is the biggest business on the planet, turning over four to five trillion dollars a year, it's bigger than guns and drugs, it's bigger than defense, they control the newspapers, they control the governments. But these companies are so big that they regulate the government which regulates them. It's not free, nothing is free, uh, but uh, cheap and efficient energy exchange is a viable concept. Now I say that everything in this universe is free energy. It's been dreamed of for hundreds of years that somewhere, someplace, as Tesla said, man will hook his machinery to the very real work which drives the universe itself. The history of science is the history of the suppression of great inventions. Uh, a few classic stories Nikola Tesla.
Nikola Tesla is regarded as the founding father of free energy. His astounding developments in the generation of alternating electrical current are still being used today. His most notorious project involved the transmission of wireless electricity into the atmosphere, which allowed for unlimited power to be freely accessed by everyone. When his financial backer, J.P. Morgan, realized that this power system could not be metered, all funding was immediately withdrawn. Tesla's electrical broadcast towers were dismantled, and through Morgan's many close connections with the media and government, Tesla's career was destroyed. In 1977, Bruce De Palma unveiled the first prototype of the N machine, an electrical generator which uses rotating magnets to generate up to five times more power than it takes to drive it. I know about the fact that the Japanese government and the Indian government have ongoing projects to produce N machines for domestic power. Uh, my partner is Paramahamsa Tiwari, who is the director of the Nuclear Power Corporation of India, which operates all the nuclear plants in India. In late 70s, I learned from Bruce de Palma that he had carried out certain crucial experiments by rotating electromagnets. Tiwari tested a prototype based on de Palma's end machine under laboratory conditions. The results were deemed too impressive, causing disbelief and suspicion among conservative government officials and the power consortiums that backed the project. Tuari was forced to abandon the project completely. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. U.S. inventor Stan Myers released his water-powered car engine in 1988. The Pentagon flew a Lieutenant Colonel in last week to look at Myers' invention. There's talk of possibly using it in the Star Wars defense program and to run Army things. Myers found it virtually impossible to secure financial backing after certain Pentagon officials paid him a visit. A number of similar inventions were developed and tested all around the world. My best friend was killed over this matter. There's a, a chap here about 10 minutes away from here driving. He has been running his car on water since 1986 with the government's permission, provided that he keeps his mouth shut. And with regular intervals, using his own words, they keep warning him to keep his mouth shut. One of our um, colleagues who have been running car on the water for the 10 year period now, he's, he reckons that it's 26 times more powerful than petrol. a better mouse trap, you know, the world may be the path to your door. If you in invent a free energy machine, there'll be a path to be to your door, but you don't want those people there. One of the pivotal people that uh, I encountered early in my uh, career was Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut. Lift off. Lift off. Edgar J. Mitchell, an Apollo mission astronaut, founded the Neuretics Institute in Southern California. The Institute's charter was supposedly to develop alternative energy systems by attracting inventors from all over the country. Mitchell became extremely interested in De Palma's end machine. He made De Palma a paltry offer to buy out the invention which De Palma naturally refused. He said to me that uh, if I ever tried anything on my own in California, I would get my head blown off. So I was scared to death. The CIA operates through various very innocent looking fronts to find out what people are thinking and, and what they're inventing. Now, what's more innocent than a benign institute founded on transcendental prim principles to help new age inventors bring free energy into the world? And that situation still exists in the United States today where a person that really understands what's going on just can't get their idea out because the alternative science and medical fields have been co-opted by the intelligence services and he converted this little engine to run on water. This is many, many years ago. And he used it for several years. And somehow the news got out and one day he got visitors and he was told to dump the engine or else. Three weeks later the man was dead. And the coroner's finding was that he fell off the back of a train. He was drunk. Now it happened that he didn't drink. Even Dr. Townsend T. Brown, the uh, electrogravitic uh, research scientist, uh, has on his 16 millimeter film of his lab test, which we've got here, 
he has guys with the black suits and black hats come into the place. You can see where the legends come from. I mean, uh, uh, these guys come in and they, they, they look like, you know, bad bar to black man. I mean, it's just, it's classic. And these things do happen. There is no progressive science in a world where every scientific uh, idea is evaluated for its military potential. Power, or energy, and control of energy equals power in the new world order that is emerging. If you control the energy, the way we get around, the way we get electricity, the way we have our TVs and video cameras and stuff, if you do the control of the energy, then you've got control of the people. This uh, demonstration here of uh, the objects vibrating was caused actually by uh, self-resonation of what they call ferromagnetic and piezo uh, electric and ferromagnetic um, barium type name. And this was used in the Army for levitation experiments. And uh, this particular experiment here is showing a, a crude form of levitation that um, causes heavy objects with seven pounds here to move around on a piece of aluminum plate through self-resonance, which is many bands and frequencies that I was causing. And other objects tend to move around, but only on translational movements. Basically, I'm doing a self-resonation system and adding on to it different carriers um, through the top um, amplifier and uh, tuning in, broadening the, the uh, frequencies, the pulse rate, and that causing it to react in different uh, shapes. So almost controllable translational movement. There's really no difference on um, the surrounding materials from the main cylinder. Um, it can be plastic, steel, or very heavy objects will tend to slide around a bit. And yet, if you suspend a ring above the um, barium cylinder, you notice that the ring is held by some type of invisible force. So the applications of this in advanced applications using free energy or zero point energy to power it would be in uh, propulsion technology. And um, that would be applicable to the forces that this type of material puts out. The objects you are seeing um, moving there is a form of levitation by uh, translational movement, meaning that the objects become lighter and can float around, the heaviest being the barium cylinder that you see there um, with the two wires coming out of it. it tends to slide around on seven pounds of its own weight. So um, that's basically what um, you're seeing. Uh, the physics of it is uh, self-resonation uh, through a power amplifier and broad and narrow uh, bands of electrical energy going into this crystal. The long-term applications could be used in uh, propul space propulsion and uh, perhaps in medical research and metallurgical research. Well, if microphones actually are made out of the same material as a large cylinder of barium titanate, and there's a self-resonation effect taking place there. And that goes through the amplifiers, and then I broaden and narrow the, the bandwidths and add pulses in that to create the effects you've just seen. Using common minerals, I'm able to capture the um, jitter of the zero-point energy that's the talk, hot talk of many physicists around the world. And I'm able to create uh, cells and structures similar to this one here that actually produce power for long periods of time. As you can see, we're getting a reading here of almost half an electron volt from this um, pile of um, crystals. And this is steady and has been tested up to a year's time and under stress tests also. 
So, which made me decide to then, of course, mount the same material in cylinders. And these cylinders here, of course, are various types of cylinders. One being an artillery shell or aluminum cylinders. Um, I could take this one here and do a reading on him. And actually, you cannot see that, but we'll try here. Okay, I can't really tell what we're getting. About half a volt, about half electron volt. And this guy here. Different cylinders, of course, there are different mixes in there, and I found that uh, that some of the cylinders are not as powerful as this material here or this very tiny one here. Actually, this has more power than this large artillery shell unit here. And what I want to do, of course, is to um, <coughs> demonstrate it in the sense of it making actual power. And that means to turn a small motor. And that can be done. I've accomplished that many, many times. We're just taking a reading here on the very small one one cubic inch of um, raw material from the earth it's still powering for over a year basically I want to use these as replacements for batteries which I think I can achieve and um, to demonstrate even more so I'm looking for a hot cylinder which I'll call a hot one or maybe be this one which is a combination of material from this little cylinder back into here. Instead, actually, to, well, we can take a volt meter reading on him and see if he's up to par. We get 1.635 electron volts, so I think that he's lively enough to power this little motor. And we'll find out. So I'm holding this motor here. I attach a lead to the base, get him out of the way, okay, I'm attaching this to the base here, another lead, the top, and it should spin, which it does, so yeah, basically, this kind of material powering motors. Of course, a very small motor at this time, but scaled up in larger amounts of, of material can power up to uh, several horsepower if needed. So that basically is sort of the secret to the energy crisis, in my opinion, anyhow. It's using ordinary materials, non-toxic, that will interface with zero-point energy in space and time. Now we're taking a reading of one of the most powerful ones. The 1.635 volts, fluctuating a bit, but uh, very steady and strong. And that was the one that powered the little motor. There's quite a host of natural, non-toxic non um, minerals in there that uh, activate. Much similar to the Moray valve of 1927, where Moray used natural minerals and got a lot of power in the range of uh, about 5,000 watts usable power at um, 110 volts at 400 cycles per second. Long wire antenna. Using basically the same kind of principles. It's sort of a shake and bake recipe. It's extremely simple, ridiculously simple. And I do that. I simply just put it in, and heat it up, shake it around, and let it crystallize. And once it's crystallized, then the, it, it captures and, and conforms to the zero-point energy that's around all of this. And uh, actually, I find the most simple, simplest of the recipes, the most powerful, meaning this little fellow here, where I tried to advance the uh, str field strength or the energy, however, failing in, in a few of these cylinders, which are quite, as one would say, it would only put out millivolts. Milli um, 
this one here is another powerhouse unit. Being smaller, actually, they tend to get stronger. Again, it's reading about um, similar to this pile here. But again, I should take a reading on this because he's quite interesting to a lot of people. Being the smallest of them, uh, that would be approximately a third of a volt. Always steady, always strong. I've used direct shorts on these kind of together for days at a time, and they still still keep on pumping out energy. Some explanations, of course, can be found in solid state uh, physics in the old ham radio magazines when transistors were first coming out. And that will help the viewer to uh, see some of the uh, technology in those days and to the f for the future can see also the possibilities of um, what they call a space charge and junction barrier type of technologies and crystals. The interesting aspect of this technology is that these cells, crystalline cells, can be put in series and parallel to add up voltage and also add up amperage. So theoretically, if you had a room or a refrigerator full of them, you could power a lot of different types of appliances. You can, you can have 110 volts if you wish, if you had them all in series and in parallel for the amps. Plus, well, also, they'd, they cooperate with one another going in series and parallel. This makes them quite practical. Plus, they're very cheap to make, and they are basically from just nature's own raw minerals. I've done better than that. You'd think you'd know his name. Every time you switch on a light or turn on your radio, his contributions are as far-reaching as those of Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, or even his nemesis, Tom Edison. This mysterious, tall, dark Serbian invented alternating current, wireless communication, the modern electric motor, basic laser and radar technology, X-rays, neon, robotics, remote control and cellular technology. Tesla was on a mission dedicated to unlocking the secrets of nature, his greatest obsession. He left little time for relationships or business. Nikola was exceedingly vulnerable in this regard. Wall Street monster J.P. Morgan was always lurking in the background, salivating over Tesla's patents. He wanted total control of the new power industry and would even crash Wall Street in order to shake out the competition. J.P. Morgan towered above all the Wall Street people like Samson over the Philistines. There were repercussions. One dark afternoon, Tesla tore up his own royalty agreement with Westinghouse, a contract potentially worth billions of dollars in order to save their company from financial doom. This insane act of generosity was never reciprocated, even after Westinghouse's death in 1913. Despite the volatile world of finance in those days, Tesla was still courted by the rich and powerful. Nikola would soon engage the biggest fish in the pond while undertaking his greatest venture, Wardenclyffe. This fantastic structure was the very culmination of Tesla's vision to create a worldwide communication system for sending sound and pictures. The primary goal was to beat Marconi for the honor of delivering the world's first transatlantic wireless signal. By no accident, Tesla's grand project was to be financed by the devil himself, J.P. Morgan. You're a strange man indeed, Tesla. After the papers are signed, you may draw upon the house of Morgan, but... It's important that I remain a silent partner. You do understand what that means, don't you, Mr. Tesla? But Nikola had a secret. The system could also electrify the world. Wardenclyffe would provide limitless, free energy everywhere for everybody. When J.P. Morgan found out about this leap of technology, he wouldn't tolerate it. He knew Tesla could deliver, and the banker overlord couldn't put a meter on it. 
A man always has two reasons for doing anything. A good reason. And the real reason. Mid-construction, Morgan would cancel the contract and blackball Tesla. That's excluding him from any other investor. Mr. Morgan, are you going to leave me in a hole? I've made a thousand powerful enemies on your account. In a hundred years from now, this country would give me much for the first honor of transmitting power without wires. Wardenclyffe faltered, and Marconi sent his transatlantic signal. Tesla would suffer his second nervous breakdown, and never again would he regain his momentum as before. But despite his cruel fate, Nicholas stayed the course. Decade after decade would pass, and he would bring forth new fantastic inventions. No one could begin to imagine what great secrets this mad scientist kept locked inside his head. No one, except J. Edgar Hoover and his G-men. They waited patiently for the great man to pass, and were ready to take everything that Nikola left behind. Hey everybody, this is Jamie. Um, just want to get another video posted real quick. One of the first comments was, "Will this thing levitate in the air by itself?" So I put some t copper, or uh, put some tape on the copper windings to protect them. We got my needle ball here. Uh, if the coil is energized. Put it in there. You see, it takes off. I chase it around the floor. I have to hold it because it's got a lot of energy, a lot of magnetic energy in here. All right, you can see it. I'm going to pick it up off the off the table. You can see it just holding itself in midair, right in the middle of the coil. And it's spinning. It's spinning rapidly, pretty much uh, the same as you saw in the in the Roden Coil Fix 5 video. It's spinning just as fast. You don't really hear it because it's it's basically it's it's, it's floating in midair. See if I can show you guys this. I got to keep it straight. There it is. Can twist it a little bit. But yeah, it's um floating in midair. Come here, you. Oh. Sorry, guys, about that. Yeah, pretty interesting. Um, I've never seen any kind of effect like this before in any of my other coils. This is a Roden 360 coil. So there's a considerable amount of um, magnetic field. It's somehow defying gravity. I guess that ball is to... I don't know. It's um, it's definitely levitating in the middle of the uh, coil all by itself. There's nothing holding it up except the magnetic field. And it is spinning quite nicely, as you can see. So anyway, that's... Uh, just wanted to show you guys this real quick. It's pretty cool. We have the rodent coil hooked up to. You want to steer it? Oh, yeah, you got to loosen it up here. There you go. And you can move it around. If you follow these over, the wires go over to here. Here, which is along the way to powering this light here. It's a 60 watt incandescent bulb. All right. Right here we have a magnet. The magnet ooh, is magnetized. This is a, a standard, same same size magnet, but it's magnetized from one end to the other. The other one here is magnetized through the center. So we can cut it in half right here so you can see the side pointing to the black is north and the other side is south. Doesn't really matter, but what happens when you hit the coil? Now we hook up the coil, we're generating a magnetic field of magnetic vortex in here. And what that does is spin. You can see it in there. Nothing to do with that. You can see clearly that it's spinning. I'm trying to keep Good up man. with the frequency. So hang about this one. Just gonna take that out of here. It's the north, it's the north and south. Oh, where's that other north and south one that we had? The north with the N on it. That was the one. There it is. There it is. All right, here we got north marked. We can show that. And south is the other end. So I'm going to put that down there, and this time north-south is going to be it. Whoa.
Okay, so we'll just try to get it to... I don't know if you can see it or not. interesting is if you change the I'm going to take this transformer I'm going to flip it around to go the other direction the current same effect now I want to entertain you for the last six minutes with something amazing something that is truly amazing and it is a form of a battery that is mind-boggling and the battery is right here on my my left on your right it is a battery that produces an enormous potential difference 10, 20 kilovolts. You see a schematic here on the uh, transparency. You have a bucket of water here on the top, and you have glass, and the bucket of water is hiding behind here. Not that because we hide it from you, but that's the best place to be. And you see plastic tubing coming down, and the water can run out on the right, and it can run out on the left. If it runs out here, there is a, uh, some paint can, no top and no bottom. And you see this paint can here, it's completely open, there's a letter A. And there's another paint can on the right, there's a letter B. It's a conducting can, this is also a conducting can. And this water runs into another conducting trash can. And this water also runs into a conducting trash can. And now comes a key point that this conductor here, A, is connected through a conducting wire with C, and the conductor B, the paint can, is connected with a conducting wire through this trash can D. You let the water run for a while, and you will see between these two points here, sparks. Even when the points are as far apart as, say, five millimeters, when you're talking about at least the potential difference of something like 10, 15,000 volts, you will see the sparks. And you wait, see another spark. And you wait, and you see another spark. So this is a power supply. And there must be energy coming from somewhere. And so problem for one, which you haven't seen yet on your force assignment, is asking you how this works. I will demonstrate it today, and I will come back to it later. The way it works is actually quite subtle, but I want you to think about it. It's a remarkable battery, a remarkable power supply. As the water starts running, I want to draw your attention to the fact that you can almost anticipate when the, start, when the spark occurs. Because the water, at the very last, is beginning to spread. It doesn't come out anymore just like a narrow cylinder, but it begins to spread. And then comes the spark. And then it goes back to running normally, and then slowly in time it will spread, and then comes the spark. So let us get it going. We have some light here. Marcos and Bill spent a lot of time getting this going. Marcos, do I have all my lights the way you want them? You're happy with that. There you see the two balls, which are really here. And let's first look at the sparks. So I will start the water running now. Let's just be patient a little bit. And let's see where we see in spark. Keep, ah, did you see one? Did you see the spark? Well, you were not looking. Man, you're paying for this. Look at the uh, 
Look at the two balls. Give it some time again. I have to charge up. Ah, uh, I can already anticipate it's coming up. It's coming up. Yeah! Did you see it? 10, 15,000 volts. Let's give it a little bit more time and then we'll take a look at the water flow, which I can see. I'm close. But we can make you see the water flow. Look again. Ah, it's coming up. Ah, did you see it? I could see it coming up. I can make you listen by having my microphone near the water. You can hear this water running. Familiar really sound to all of us. And now the sound changes. You hear change? And there's a spark. Once more. Just running. Spreading. Coming up. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? I can make you see this water. Just stay there. We have one and a half minutes left. So now you can see the water. You happy with the light, Marcos? You can improve on it. So look at the water. Ah, it was just spreading already. You can't see the spark and the water at the same time. See, the water is running now normally. It's going to spread slowly. I will tell you when I see the spark here, but it's already, I can almost predict when it happens. The water is spreading now. Coming up shortly. Yeah, I saw the spark. And you immediately see the water go like this. I want you to think about it and explain this. This is one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in my life. we have here is a uh, cup of uh, boiling hot water. Just boiled that in the microwave. And we also have a Stirling engine here. Uh, the concept is pretty simple. The heat from the boiling cup of water um, creates uh, hot air in the Stirling engine cylinder. That air rises and as it rises it, it turns the flywheel and as the air reaches the top of that cylinder it cools off and uh, the flywheel keeps turning around. Uh, this Stirling engine can run about 25 minutes, maybe half an hour on one cup of uh, boiling water. Can be tea, could be coffee. Um, nice thing to have on your desk uh, to remind you of some of the different ideas out there for creating energy. Alright, starting. Uh, let's see here. The uh, strength point three point five. What reading do you have? Point six. No, oh, need better than that.
Yeah, a little cloud filament. Forty-six. Coming down again. Oop, nice and bright. Forty-seven. Keep your focus. You are looking at a new battery technology that was released at this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Nevada. It was invented by Tadashi Ichikawa of Tokyo, Japan. And what you are looking at is a battery that consists of 10 1.5 volt 1000 milliamp cells that run off of water or any other kind of liquid that you choose. What is unique about this is he's been able to take the 1.5 volt cells, put them in series, get 15 volts of DC power out of them, and run it through a converter inverter, and get 110 volts of power to run small household appliances such as lights, radios, and TVs. As you notice, it has a 12 volt connection there in the back. And as I'm swinging around here, I'm going to show you what one of the cells looks like. This is upside down. The top is the contact there. And as you would flip it around the other way, as I'm getting ready to do here, you will see that's where you put the liquid in, right there in the bottom. So all these cells are sitting with the open side up. And um, again, it runs off of any kind of liquid, has a 10 year shelf life, and it produces 110 volts of current. Uh, quite a very unique product. Well, Boney here again. I've just made these batteries out of water and miracle grow in them. Uh, I've done the copper and zinc arrangement. So it's a little bit different. If you can see. Obviously you've got copper on the right, zinc on the left, bolt and go to the bolt. Right. There's actually two batteries here. There's 14 pots there. That's producing around about 13 volts nearly. And then there's another row. Same again, about 13 volts nearly. And I've wired them both in series so they're giving exactly here. You can see the meter. 12.97 volts altogether, but the amperage should be quite high on this. Right, I mean, this is my one watt LED bulb, which you've seen before. It's not lit at the moment. Right, this is a this is just one bank of batteries. This is. There we are. You can see it lit up. Right. Now the voltmeter has just dropped down a little bit. Should drop down a bit more than that, really. Right. So that's lit. Right, I'm going to connect the other bank of batteries now. Or should I say the other bank of pots? And you'll see the amperage builds up and the brightness goes brighter. Now guys, this is just moving on from the film canisters, I've decided to upgrade to the ice tray, Mark II. And what I've done there is just put in 10 cent pieces, copper 10 cent pieces, zinc galvanized iron, got tiny little uh, neodymium magnets there to act as a link, a bridge there to, instead of a wire, I don't like using wires much. 
Okay, so it goes all the way around, comes back to here. Copper positive and zinc negative. And I'm getting about 12 volts out of this baby. You can see there, oh, it's up to 14 volts now. And that's just from putting them in series, salt water, followed on top by equal parts spirit of salt and vinegar. Watered down, of course, both of those before they're mixed. And that's nothing surprising to me. I expected to get about 12 volts out of that. I'm getting 14. But what really I was interested in was raising the amperage. And that's done through adding the spirit of salt and the vinegar, it seems. And now, where I was pushing about 0.2 of a milliamp, now I'm getting 2.5, or I say 2. It slowly drops there. You can see it dropping down. Now, that is what I was after. I just wanted to raise that milliamps because the amps are where all the work's done. That's where the current is, and you can see the result there is pretty impressive. That's a lead light running off earth and a solution. Um, and it's a natural solution, so look at that. Not bad at all. You could make them in series now again. Okay, here's the uh, little motor with the propeller running off the earth battery current alone. I have this little uh, container to keep it out of the uh, weather. But you can see here that it's just spinning away. It's uh, pretty cool because I don't have a capacitor or anything hooked up to it. I've got the uh, the negative wire runs up here and it comes over here and I've got it going down to the uh, the ground here and I've got my uh, magnesium ribbon running up that ditch that you see right there. I don't know if you can see it's just two three inches under the soil, but yeah, that runs up over to here and that forms the uh, the negative connection and my positive uh, line runs across here. I have them uh, going into the ground set at 24 feet apart. But my positive goes into the ground here. You can see the uh, copper pipe here and attached to that copper pipe I've run about right now about 12 feet of copper wire and that really jumps my milliamps up. I'm now at 21 milliamps. I'm going to go ahead and extend that copper wire and see if I can't get up around uh, 50 milliamps or higher and uh, maybe extend the magnesium ribbon as well. It'll be interesting to see see how many milliamps we can get up to with this thing. But yeah, it's really cool. I never would have thought I would see a small electric motor running with just uh, two wires going into the ground. Incredibly simple. It's been running all day. Um, I'll just let it keep running and keep experimenting. This is really awesome stuff. Talk to you later. Bye. Okay, I just wanted to give a quick update um, showing an experiment that I've had running for the last couple weeks. Um, what I have here is a car uh, carbon rod. I've got a wire here just to make a connection on this end. I have, um, on top of that carbon rod, I put a layer of cotton. I then wrap magnesium uh, ribbon over that. And finally, I wrap that in masking tape. Now, what's interesting about this, I never put these rods in, in the ground or in water. Um, the only electrolyte I have working here is the air and uh, the air humidity. So this little thing has just uh, been lighting this LED continuously. It has not gotten dim in any way. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, this ought to last a really, really long time considering air is uh, functioning as the electrolyte. It's great because uh, it's the first time I've built something like this and not had to put it in the water or in the ground or something. So I plan on pursuing this um, a lot further. Okay, here's an update on my air batteries. I've continued to improve these. I've made a few uh, changes to them. I will make a how to make uh, the Laser Saber air battery video shortly uh, with my latest improvements. But I have been testing uh, this single air battery for the last three days. I've not put it in any water during that time. And it has been running this uh, motor continuously for three days now without having to add any additional water or anything else. So I'm really excited about that. It's really nice not to have to, uh, to wet these down. So all this is is an air battery, a soft iron core with a copper coil, copper wire coil around that, and a reed switch. And like I say, it's been going for three days.
Uh, with the success of that, I decided to try a, a three-cell configuration, which I have here. I have it running through a Jewel Thief, and connected uh, directly from that Jewel Thief to a compact uh, fluorescent bulb. So, quite exciting. I am really, really excited about these air batteries. Okay, unfortunately, I uh, lost all the video clips um, from the assembly of these air batteries. Um, but there's really nothing to them, so I'm just going to uh, use this light here that they're powering to illustrate how they're made. Um, this is a 3 inch by 10 inch carbon rod. And what I've done is I've put a layer between the carbon rod and the uh, magnesium ribbon. That layer in these batteries is just paper towel, just household paper towel. One layer thickness, it wraps around the carbon rod. I put masking tape in a couple places to hold it, and then I start uh, wrapping on my magnesium ribbon. Now it's important to, uh, to make sure the magnesium ribbon never overlaps on itself. You want about an eighth inch gap between each uh, wine. If it touches itself, you won't get as uh, much current out of your air battery. Terminal, I drilled into the center of the carbon rod and put a, uh, put a copper wire there to connect my uh, positive terminal. Now these will run uh, like my magnetic motor and stuff just straight off. Um, without doing anything to them, but I've figured out a way to really activate these. What you do is you um, you mix uh, salt into water, boil the salt into some water, and do an application on the paper towel of that. And uh, that will really bring out the power in these cells. It doesn't seem to uh, destroy the magnesium ribbon at a, any rapid rate at all that I've noticed. At the Sequoia Symposium gatherings, I learned of inventors who claimed they were using the torus dynamic as the basis for devices that generated energy without combustion. This revolutionary development, accessing what's sometimes called zero point or radiant or free energy, is now being called most simply new energy technology. Given that so much of the suffering in our world is the result of lack of access to energy, I realized that free, unlimited, clean energy would be one of the greatest breakthroughs in history. It could not just improve, but actually transform the quality of life on this planet.